Okay, so um, I am going to get rid of that. Um, all right, so I wanted to talk about kind of early U.S. involvement in the Middle East. Um, this is one of the, um, it, it's an important piece to understand first off, like, when you're talking about kind of the buildup of frustrations um, that lead ultimately to 9-11, also the fact that the U.S. kind of has this perpetual, you know, staffing. I mean, we're, we're always having troops in the Middle East, right? Where does this begin, right? And well, it begins now, right? Talking about this period with um, Carter and with Reagan and all this kind of stuff. And so um, to kind of help you understand that, you need to understand some of the background. Plus, you need to understand the Camp David Accords, why they mattered, um, as far as Jimmy Carter has been kind of the, the, the peak moment for him. Um, but it also helps us understand kind of the, the tense uh tension that exists in the Middle East and kind of why that area become, can become so frustrating. Um, again, this is only a partial timeline. I'm not focusing too much on uh, on the Iranian part of it. I mean, we're not going all the way back to, you know, World War One partitioning. We're not going all the way back to, you know, U.S. relations in Iran. Um, we're not really touching on the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So this is just kind of with a main focus around Israel and some of the events that really kind of shape American history. Um, so the next thing that you need to be familiar with is going to be um, the founding of Israel in 1948. So World War II is over. Um, you have the creation of the United Nations. You've got the, 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 the Nuremberg trials where they hold the Nazis accountable for what had happened. Um, and there's this great move, and there'd always been kind of the Zionist movement um, that talked about creating Israel. Um, but after World War II, it really gains momentum, and the U.S. completely supports that. Now, of course, remember, the U.S. didn't adjust its immigration quotas um, going into World War II. So in the late 1930s, we didn't want Jewish people coming into the country. Um, but then suddenly after World War II, we're the best friend, right? Um, and we definitely support uh, the foundation of Israel. Um, the U.S. very quickly recognizes the state of Israel when it's created. Um, and so you have kind of this long-lasting relationship between the two countries. Now, obviously, with Obama, um, there's been a little bit of a cooling off of that relationship, um, but you still definitely see that um, that, that is um, kind of the backstory there, that we have kind of this connection that goes back to 1948. Uh, very soon after the creation of Israel, you're going to have the Arab-Israeli war. Um, you know, depending on how much you know your religious, you know, theology, um, you know, Arabs are Muslim. Uh, Muslims and Jews come from the same kind of founder with Abraham, but then their 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 religions diverge, and they see them. You know, uh, Arabs typically don't like uh, Israel. Um, this goes back to the children of Abraham and Hagar and her son, and all. This, there's all this whole religious backstory there. Um, Needless to say, they don't really like <laughs> the way that, that they, the United Nations just kind of said, oh, let there be Israel. And there was suddenly Israel created. And you can see from this map right here, this crazy partitioning uh, of this area that's going to be Israel. And there's supposed to be areas for a Jewish state and areas for a, an Arab state. And Jerusalem is supposed to be split between Christians and Jews and, and Muslims. And it's just a complete mess, right? Um, and they kind of create this and you have the Arabs really fighting back. Uh, the Jewish, man, Jewish, the Israelis manage to hold their own um, with some help from the United States and, and that kind of thing. So, um, uh, Israeli independence is achieved 1948, 1949. Um, and they go a few years where everything's kind of settled down. Um, what will happen is that um, we have the Suez crisis. And I touched on this very, very briefly um, when we talked about Eisenhower. Um, U.S. and Britain had offered to help build the Aswan Dam. Um, but Nasser, uh, who doesn't trust the Americans because of their close relationship with Israel and their support of Israeli independence, um, decides to kind of cozy up with the Soviet Union. 
The U.S. gets mad. Um, and so we say, fine, we're not going to give you any money to help build that. And to which Egypt says, fine, we're going to nationalize the Suez Canal and we're not going to let Israel use it at all. Um, and so this is going to trigger an invasion of Egypt. Now, um, one of the things that will happen is that Eisenhower will come out and say, OK, everybody back to their corners. Right. Um, remember, it, uh, Eisenhower was not a big fan of using military involvement, but he was willing to use the brinksmanship. If you remember me talking about, you know, don't make me use these nuclear weapons um, to kind of get everybody to chill out. Um, and so we kind of have everyone pulling back to where they were before, um, you know, and so the Suez crisis um, is kind of a, kind of another little small eruption of kind of tensions in the Middle East. Um, and so you might just kind of be familiar with that, how the U.S. basically shaped that conflict by saying, uh, don't make us come over there, because if we do, you're not going to like it. Um, and basically that they were able to influence Israel's uh, foreign policy by getting them to back off. Sorry, my dogs are super annoying today. Um, in 1967, so roughly 10 years later, uh, you have another conflict breaking out with um, Israel against Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. Israel at this point uh, invades um, some areas, some territory. Uh, they basically kick butt and take names during the Six Day War. Um, completely shocks the Arab nations. Um, and of course, a lot of this has to do with the support that they've had um, from, you know, from the United States with military support and that kind of thing. Um, but you can see that they take the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, and the West Bank, uh, as well as the Golan Heights. Now, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip are areas that are still contentious today. Now, eventually they will get back the Sinai Peninsula, um, but these other territories, they don't give, at, get, give back. And this is kind of a source of tension even now. Um, so the Six Day War in 1967 is pretty important. Um, and again, of course, if you think about what's happening in the United States in 1967, um, this is a very difficult period with the Vietnam conflict going into the 1968 um election cycle, that kind of thing. So you want to be familiar that we've had this, this kind of persistent problem in the Middle East since 1948 and the creation of Israel. Um, and that, that the U.S. continues, uh, now with the Six-Day War, the U.S. doesn't have to step in, but understand that part of why Israel is able to be so successful is because the U.S. has been supporting them for about 10 years, supporting them in the sense of selling them lots of military equipment. Um, but this is one of the reasons why, if you're a kind of a uh, uh, NCIS fan, yeah, the, the Israeli um agent or whatever. Yes, she was known for being pretty tough. Um, that's because in Israel, you had to be pretty tough. Israel has compulsory military service for men and women. Um, this is a, this is a hardcore kind of military country, um, that should kind of help explain some of the, the foreign policy. They've just recently had an election, um, where basically they, um, elected a very nationalistic, very pro-military kind of guy. Um, and that's because this is the environment that they live in. Um, then, uh, about, uh, five years later, 1973, uh, Egypt and Syria, um, jointly attack Israel, uh, on a holy day, um, trying to regain the territory they lost in the six day war. Um, Egypt and Syria are pushed back. Um, and basically the Yom Kippur war ends without kind of without any real significant changes. But again, we have another kind of eruption of conflict. Now, 67 and 73, the U.S. is staying out of it. But why? Because, well, Vietnam, and then you've got the Watergate scandal. Um, lots of other things going on <laughs> in 67 and 73 for the U.S. Um, so the, so the, um, so basically the, uh, Israelis are holding their own in this particular, uh, area, even though the U.S. had kind of stepped in a little bit with the Suez Canal. Um, so by 1979, this is why when Carter comes in and he kind of hosts the Camp David Accords, um, getting peace between Israel and Egypt, if you'll notice, Egypt is one of the common areas that we've had a lot of crisis, right? The Suez Crisis, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, all involved Egypt. Um, so getting peace between Israel and Egypt is kind of a big deal. Um, and so they, they get some initial accords to kind of deal with Palestinian territories, to create a peace treaty. Um, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin 
uh, will share the Nobel Peace Prize for signing these accords. And it is kind of seen as a step towards peace in the Middle East. Unfortunately, um, there's not a whole lot of progress made after this. Um, and that would be true even today. Um, so just kind of know that 1979, the Camp David Accords are the last significant kind of action. Uh, and it's the U.S. taking a lead foreign policy wise, getting everybody to kind of calm down and go back to their corners um, and that kind of thing. Um, so you just might keep that in mind. Um, you'll want to be familiar with what the Camp David Accords are, what they do with American leadership towards the Camp David Accords um, and kind of in how it how it shapes um, you know, what it says about kind of the tensions in the Middle East during this period. Um, also happening right after the Camp David Accords is going to be the Iranian hostage crisis. Again, um, it's not that the Camp David Accords are a direct trigger for the hostage crisis. In fact, um, the Iranians that had looked at several different embassies to take over, but it is kind of part of this frustration this continuing support of the U.S. Uh, for Israel, um, for trying to broker this peace. People are seeing the U.S. is really kind of sticking their nose in where it doesn't belong. Um, and then in Iran, you've got kind of this whole different trajectory. Um, and I've mentioned before how the Shah of Iran was installed. Um, and then in 1964, he exiles Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, finally, that uh, the Khomeini returns to Iran um, and becomes the leader. And then the U.S. allows the Shah to come into the U.S. to kind of seek medical treatment. Um, and so shortly after Khomeini come, becomes the leader of Iran and you have kind of this overthrow of the Shah, um, you're going to have the U.S. embassy being taken over. Um, and again, you know, and I mentioned this when we talked about Carter, he tries economic sanctions, he tries a military operation. None of that's very successful. Finally, uh, on Reagan's inauguration day, 1981, the hostages are released. Um, very clearly, they're, you know, Iran doesn't want to hold on to the hostages. They want to get rid of the Western influence that kind of made their point. Um, and I think that kind of tells us a lot about Iran. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, that we should trust Iran implicitly. Um, Iran, you know, th they have their own agenda, to be sure. Um, but Iran also has a very different kind of mindset. Um, while they are very fundamentalist, they're very strict Islam or Muslim, um, you do see that they have kind of a practical side. Um, and obviously that them releasing the hostages in 1981, um, why continue this policy with Ronald Reagan? Um, you know, they made their point with Jimmy Carter. Um, and, you know, and, and part of it is they were mad at Jimmy Carter for the sanctions and that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, so now we have this historic uh, nuclear agreement with Iran. And yes, I do think we have to be a little bit careful, but I do think it's important to understand that Iran is a different type of country. Um, and that in, if you're looking at in conjunction with several of the other countries in that region, that are very kind of fundamentalist, very kind of radical Islam, um, that, you know, very much led by theocracy and that kind of thing. Um, I, Iran's probably not the worst one out there. Um, you know, that there's some, you know, some other interesting situations in the Middle East. Um, and I think that the Iranian hostage crisis kind of shows us that the Iranians can ultimately be very practical when need be. Um, next, and I'm going to, this will kind of be like towards the end of what we're going to talk about here with the Middle East. Um, 1982, uh, you have a, a Lebanon, uh, a civil war happening. You also have the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, um, launching attacks against Israel from southern Lebanon. And some of that's being the perception is that Lebanon is supporting that. Understand that Lebanon has a very strong Christian contingent. Um, and so you've got this real kind of religious tension, kind of a religious civil war, as well as having this Palestinian kind of influence um, and frustration about the power of Israel. Um, and so the, that's going to be, the Lebanon war is going to be a big deal. Um, the U.S. military will then move into Lebanon in 1983 um, as 
peacekeepers with the United Nations. Um, their presence there is going to be seen as kind of an insult. Um, this is kind of the beginning of the terrorist attacks, right? Um, 1983, you have a suicide bomber uh, blow up American barracks. Uh, you've got 241 American servicemen killed. Um, if you talk to Miss Gandy, she can uh, tell you about that. Her husband was in the Marines uh, when this happened. Um, and um, so, yes, it's definitely uh, the beginning of kind of a new sort of tactic by people in the Middle East to try to spook the United States out and a real sense that the U.S. is starting to stick their nose in where it doesn't belong. Um, and so 1983 is kind of where I'm going to end this because we don't really have another major event happening until you get to the 1990s and you have the Gulf War um, with uh, Saddam Hussein and that kind of thing, which is a whole different kind of phase of kind of U.S. involvement. But this is the early involvement in the Middle East. Again, you see this kind of preference for Israel. You see the U.S. trying to shape policy in kind of a peacekeeping kind of advisory sort of way. Um, and we're going to see that, that that's still resented and you're still going to have some tensions happening there um, with that kind of thing. So this kind of takes us up to the 1980s. Um, we'll see that during Reagan's administration, you have some terrorist attacks and that kind of thing. Um, but for the most part, the Middle East just kind of simmers in kind of this kind of like a pot of boiling of water that's almost boiling, but not quite. Um, and so it's just kind of simmering there for a while until you start to get to the Gulf War in the 1990s. Um, which we'll talk about later. Um, so just kind of know this is the background for U.S. involvement in the Middle East, again, with uh, the U.S. keeping troops there as peacekeepers, um, with the U.S. trying to influence policy through the Camp David Accords or through the you know influence in the Suez crisis. Um, and you also see that the U.S. is is resented for being there and resented for who it supports and who it doesn't. Um, and kind of how these policies, you know, whether you're talking about OPEC, uh, deciding to have an embargo because of our support um, of Israel during the Yom Kippur War, or whether it's you know the Iranian hostage crisis, these events do tend to influence us here at home. Um, so we can't be completely isolated from that, even though this is happening a world away and it's not having, it's not like completely directly involved with us. Um, and yet it is, and so we can't escape that. And so this is kind of the early steps towards getting us involved the way we are now, right? Which is having troops in Afghanistan and having troops in Iraq and dealing with these situations on a constant basis and having a renegotiated nuclear treaty with Iran and having a, a difficult, a complicated relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, and, you know, people looking to the U U.S. asking us to step in for some human rights reasons. And yet there's also groups that don't want us there at all. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. And we'll be talking about that more as we move through the uh, into the 1990s. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Iran-Contra scandal when we talk about Ronald Reagan um, and kind of how that's related. But that really has more to do with his anti-communism in Central America. And Iran is just kind of a conduit. Um, but it also kind of plays into why they were willing to release the hostages um, under Reagan and that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, so this is your third lecture. Um, the next one, we'll talk about Ronald Reagan specifically.